Alrighty, welcome back to Boys University podcast. Um, we're on episode uh what eighteen now? Seventeen. Seventeen. All right. Um, you're fucking. But do you want to kick us off today? Or... <laughs> he wasn't listening at all. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'll kick us off. Um. So Wait, first can, I just, I wanna, can I just say before yeah. we kick off, like that might be the worst intro anyone's ever run. Wait, what's wrong with that? It was going well. I just, I just didn't know. It was like, a pretty bad intro. Be... As far oh, as intros go, okay, okay. I can do it again. I can do it again. Well, I just, I just gotta say welcome back, and then we just gotta say I'll just introduce the first topic. Right? No, no, okay, no we're, not, we're, we're not, we're not, we're not gonna no, let you run it back. I'm fuck intro. you, I'm doing it. Cut it here, cut it here, cut it here. Start again. Yeah, I'll do it again. I'll do it again. I'll do it again. Okay, okay. You might as well restart the recording. Then you don't. Yeah, might as well, might as well. Manually cut this out. No, it's okay. I don't mind. Just go for it. Yeah, man wants to it. He wants to smoke. Okay. Like, I respect him. Um. Okay. So, alrighty. Well, welcome back to Boys University Podcast. We're on episode seventeen now. We've got the full squad, and um. So I'll just kick us off with our first topic. Yeah. Um. So we're gonna talk about university today. <laughs> um. So, what are you guys' thoughts on um? Do you think the standard of education in Singapore universities is? <laughs> <laughs> Let's let Armand do it. Let's let Armand do it. Yeah, yeah. Armand intro it. Let Armand intro it. Take some notes. Maybe next. <laughs> 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 it's okay. Okay, it's, fine. it's fine. It's fine. This is how you learn. This is how you learn. It's, it's, like it's the first time. It's a tough one to get through. It's how you learn. Right. Are we good? It's so much harder than it Third time's a try. Third time's a try. Armand, you did. All right. Cool, cool. All right, boys. Welcome back. This is episode 17 of the Boys University podcast. Um, good to have you guys all on, all mic'd up. Um, so I'll kick us off with the first topic. Um, and this is something that I've been thinking for a while um, about doing an episode with you guys about, um, especially because um, this this particular semester, I'm taking a module on property law and it's just being atrociously run. Like I don't want to call out the school or anything, but I'm calling out the school. It's being atrociously run. So what I wanted to talk to you guys about was... Um, do you guys think that the standard of education for universities in Singapore is high or is it low? Because I feel like the general view of education at large in Singapore is that it's very well done. Like we have a very strong education system, um, especially up till, you know, junior college. But once you go into university, um, then it becomes a little bit more difficult. You know, it becomes a little bit more disparate. So especially since Bhatia is in the UK, he's in Leeds. Sahil, you've done a lot of programs in like Finland and um, I think, no, the Met Boys haven't gone overseas yet, right? All right, yeah. So so we have some sort of uh, some sort of comparisons to do. Um, so I just want to kick us off. Um, maybe, Bate, why don't you tell us a little bit about how your experience in university in terms of the level of education that you're receiving now in your course, um, how are you feeling about that? Do you think it's good? Do you think it's bad? Do you think there's room for improvement? What do you like about it? And what can you compare against your time in Singapore, specifically like in JC and in secondary school? Um, yeah, um, I, I think edu- level of education wise and like in terms of the ways like modules are run and how like competent professors and like teaching assistants and stuff are, it's pretty good. I've been, I wouldn't say pleasantly surprised, but I'm quite happy with the way it's run. But um, in terms of one difference I've seen is you alluded to the fact that our JC education is quite it's basically top tier and um, sometimes I'll see like that kind of difference in terms of people in my course and some of the questions and some of the ways they like approach things you can see like a slight difference in some like in some sense of the level that they've had so far and also one thing that caught me off is like the fact that we had lectures during JC is not a normal JC thing. So these guys are only exposed to lectures in uni. So the whole concept of like, you have a lecture, then you have a seminar to kind of iron out all any problems you might have with uh, lecture notes and stuff like that. That's been interesting to me because I didn't know that it was a novel experience. I thought it's general in terms of how we all do it. So um, that jump up for them is a lot bigger than I would say is for me at least coming to a uni here because obviously I can't compare my experience to um what you guys have because i haven't experienced uni in singapore but teaching level wise and in terms of faculty wise i'd say it's been pretty good here 
So what um, specifically prompted me to bring up this topic was I was taking Harvard's CS50 course, um, which is like, it's a really well-renowned, really respected course, especially for as far as computer science courses go. Um, and I was, you know, not, not really, um, I hadn't taken any computer science courses before, not in university, not before that as well. And so I went on to YouTube and I started taking this course. And what struck me immediately was the level of enthusiasm and the ability of the professor who was teaching at David Malin, his ability to really contextualize the information and make you interested in it. And specifically, the fact that, at least in this course, they don't assume any prior knowledge, right? Which is such a fundamental um, kind of component of teaching, right? Being a good teacher, you don't assume that the students know anything. You try and make it as easily digestible to them as possible. Try to explain it like they're a five-year-old. And then I, when I compare that to, you know, the kind of uh, lectures we've been having in, in law school now, it's just worlds apart. When I remember when I took my first course in uh, law, um, we were studying law of torts. And torts is like supposed to be a very easily understandable topic insofar as it's easy for you to contextualize. So basically torts is just everyday wrong to get hit by a car. You know, that's some sort of tort. Some sort of negligence happens. That's some sort of tort. Um, but immediately when we started taking the course, I found myself like from day one confused. I didn't know what was going on. I felt like the lecturers were quite inconsistent sometimes. Um, it was quite difficult to digest information. And I wasn't sure if that is a thing that we experience across the universities in Singapore. And, you know, on the other side, I don't know if that, ha that level of education that the Harvard professors are giving is that consistent across um, the entire of Harvard, across the US. I'm sure it's not. Um, but that's why I wanted to throw it to you first, Bhatia, because I wanted to understand, like, you know, what kind of teachers do you have um, in the UK? Especially since, you know, university is supposed to be a place where you kind of, like, learn about yourself, learn about your interest, understand more in depth about different ideologies that people have. Um, so, like, kind of more towards that aspect of things. How are the professors um, who are teaching you? Do they really engage in the subject? Do they, do they make you engage in the subject? Mm, I'd say for... For what I've realized, at least, is um, as much as I can like try and speak for what it's like. I was actually having a conversation with one of my friends um, last night, and he's doing um, engineering. Um, and he was complaining about the uni. He was saying like his professors aren't there to help him, and like when he struggles with something, he has literally no one to go to. So it's not. So my experience isn't what I would say every single student here is going through. But for me, it's been extremely good. The professors who run the lectures. I don't know if it's the same for you guys, so I'll say how it is for me, but professors run lectures, so one lecture a week, whether it's an hour or two hours. Then you have seminars with teaching assistants who are often like postgrad students. So these guys are like late 20s, early 30s, and they have a good understanding of the subject, but obviously they don't have enough to run a lecture for you. So in terms of lecturers, you've got these like 40, 50-year-old people. And in media, I was a bit thrown off at first because I thought media like all of your professors would be slightly younger but you've got these guys with like immense knowledge they've written books they know everything there is to know they're excited about the subject they explain things really well kind of like what you were saying in terms of like explain it to me like a five-year-old it's done a lot thankfully they don't assume a baseline of knowledge it's always kind of like uh, everything's explained from the ground up so that's been great teaching assistants are extremely competent it's all been really good and in terms of like, like they manage to make things interesting. Sometimes the readings can be quite dull, but they still manage to make things really interesting. So it's actually been pretty good. How are we through this aisle? Um, you spent some time in Finland taking some, some courses on environmental science. Did you notice any difference in the quality of education, the type of education you're receiving there versus what you're receiving in TU? No, so I mean, unfortunately, that's not like I, I didn't take courses there. So what 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 I did was just um like uh we we went there like as the like some of the people from the from my scholars program we went there and it was more of like a tour by different departments about what research is being done and it wasn't environment wasn't extremely environmental science focused. So it's like one day was chemistry, one day was physics. So I I I can't I definitely can't say like um I can't make any comparisons to the style of education there. But I can comment on the 
Okay, I think um, just in case we have new listeners, so just for some context, I take environmental science at NTU. Ariman takes uh, market marketing. Uh, media, media and communications. Close enough. Close enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Media and comms in Leeds. Um, Aman takes law in NUS, and Harun and Bharat are med students in NUS and NTU, respectively. Okay, so my course in environmental science. I think um. So you guys mentioned. I think a few uh a few sort of like may um basis to judge the quality of education, like um the how enthusiastic a professor is, how well they explain it to you from a base level and stuff like that. And I think if I look at those in my uni, my professors are quite interested in what they have to teach, which is good. Like they are very enthusiastic about it. Like I've got this MATLAB module now, like it's coding, and I thought I would hate it, which I do hate the mod but i thought it would be like dreadful but i've got this like french professor who's like he gets so excited about mad lab he and he just makes the lesson fun and so and what he's done is like he's the group project is like you can do whatever you want as long as you use mad lab so my my group's like seeing whether sharknado will happen one day so what i'm trying to see is um i think i've gotten quite lucky in that my, my professors why, why 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 is he laughing i'm, I'm being serious why, why are you laughing <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing for? I just didn't expect that. I really didn't expect that to come <laughs> yeah. at the shark end of the needle. sentence. Yeah. <laughs> what, the shark needle thing? Yeah. Yeah, okay, fair enough. But yeah, so stuff like that, it's made me, it's made a more, it's made me interested in a coding mod, which I never thought I would be. So I think, um. so in my experience, Singapore, Singapore professors, like the professors in teaching in Singapore, have uh, managed to make us pretty excited and they do teach us stuff from scratch like um sometimes to a fault like you know it's like again i'll go back to this mad lab more because i just really think this professor is really good and it's like um you know it's like he spent like an hour teaching us basic math that we need and you know it's, it's like i think they really do try to focus on building the knowledge from the ground up but that being said there's another question that needs to be asked is um uh local profs like the teaching style between local profs and foreign profs who come to Singapore, that plays a huge difference. Like for my course, it's mainly um, profs from the Western culture and I can feel that difference. But when I talk to my friends who take mods from uh, professors taught by people from Eastern countries or even like Singaporean profs, you can really feel the difference. So that's another thing that <clears throat> makes it a bit hard to, I think kind of judge the quality of education in Singapore, even the style, just because you have those very two different ideologies coming together. But Sahil, what's the what's the difference you see when you speak to your friends who are doing other mods? I think one of them is just the mindset of um with uh Eastern profs, you get this mindset of like, um, if you've got more time, if you can do more, you should. Versus with um, I think profs from the Western culture, they are more of just do a, a certain amount of work and it's good that you've got extra time, like free free time and stuff. Like, you know, like for example, um, this one prof during, we had a mod in like Bali and stuff and this one uh, prof, this Western guy, <laughs> and he like, um, like their, their, philo their, their policy was, they literally told us, we know that if we let you submit this like on day X, you're going to be working throughout the night trying to perfect it because you guys are all competitive. So we're going to make sure every day you submit whatever you need to at 6 p.m. And then so that at night you get to rest. And I think that really struck me as like, wow, I've never had a teacher or a prof who actually tries, who knows that Singaporean students or students in general are super competitive and super worried. So they're just going to, if they know they have more, so they prevented that. So I think that's one big difference I see. And another thing is the general enthusiasm with which they teach. Like all the profs, I, profs I've had about um like the western profs they just they kind of make me a bit happier to be in the lesson and i mean this is an overgeneralization maybe but this is just how I, i've experienced it like i feel i feel the energy permeate through me like they're just happy to tell me more about their mod and just in the class they're just a bit happier they're just you know a bit more joyful and i just don't really feel that way when i get taught by um local profs as much so it's kind of that point on that point, I I have a I have one professor who is I think he's from China. Uh he's definitely not like local local. 
but he's the only professor that I've actually felt like he actually kind of made the attempt to get us to be more engaged with the subject outside of an exam situation. Like we have professors who, like local professors who are very exam oriented and they're like, okay, this is what you need to know for the exam. Here's how, you know, I'm going to prepare you to the best of my abilities for the exam. And that's good in a certain sense, because obviously, you know, we want to do well for our exams and sometimes the most practical, pragmatic format to do that is just not the most it's not the format that makes you the most interested in the subject. But this prof, because he set our exam to be a research paper, whenever we do consultations with him, he takes us into his office. You know, we all sit down. It's like four or five of us. And he really discusses like um, kind of the ideas that we have. And he encourages us. He encourages us to like delve more deeply into the ideas. And that was like sitting down in his office, talking to him about, like in this case, it was about um, like a local policy we have with regard to the HDB um, quotas. Sitting down with him and having him be interested in a topic that we chose and having him like prompt us for more information about that and give us like different ideas as to how to approach the subject a little bit differently. That felt like a much more intimate setting that made me, like encouraged me to be interested in, in the topic itself. Whereas if I compare it to like all the other modules I've had, it's very exam oriented. So we sit down, we go for tutorials, and that's the most intimate you'll you'll be with your teachers during a tutorial, right? Because um, it's like, you know, 10 people in a class, 12 people in a class, and one professor teaching you. In those situations, it's generally just, okay, here are the tutorial questions. Let's run through the questions. If you have any questions about the topic, ask me those questions. And that, that really doesn't encourage like a deep dive into the subject itself. You don't feel any sort of connection to the subject. You don't feel like you have any autonomy over your learning that makes you want to be more interested in the subject. So I feel like maybe it's not such a like East and Western distinction. It's probably more like a local, non-local distinction. But I want to hear from the med school guys, because I guess for you guys, it's completely different, right? You guys are gearing for something very, very practical. So how do you how do you guys get taught? Uh, Barf, you can go ahead. Oh, okay. I think... Quite different. Yeah, I think uh, for us, I choose to look at it as two different ways. Lah. So... Like for the first two years, it's more like it's not really clinical, uh, so we're not in hospital, so there's more like a non clinical doctors, like, sorry, non clinical professors. So basically, they're not doctors, they're just like professors. And I think those those guys are actually mostly quite passionate about what they're teaching. Uh, like, you see, when you go for like your radiology classes, which is like t teaching how to read x rays, or like your histology classes, teaching how to read like the microscope stuff and all that, I think they're actually quite passionate. Uh, and most of them, actually, like you mentioned, most of them are from overseas, uh, I would think, like from like not really Western, but those like Indian or like those that area kind of people are. And they are quite they're quite interested in what they teach, I feel. But I feel like once the doctors come in, especially after year three, now me and Harun are in year four. Already. So after the doctors come in, they are a bit more focused on their actual job, which is being a doctor rather than teaching us. So they don't really care. Like your teaching is very self-directed. So it's more of putting the, the onus on yourself to go and find out more, to go and ask these doctors questions to yeah, like basically the onus on yourself. So I don't really think it's the same as you guys at all, honestly. It's, it's more on, on ourselves and which is quite crazy because the fees we pay is like ridiculously more than you guys because that's just how it is. So it's like it's a bit paradoxical, but yeah, that's that's just how it is. Uh. And uh yeah, but personally I feel like I don't mind that uh, like you know. I feel like the, 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 once you come to uni, like compared to JC and uni, because that's the only comparison I have, JC is like, they are teaching you everything. There's so many subjects you have, like your GP, uh, physics, bio, whatever. There's stuff that you're not really interested in, but you're just doing it because you have to do it for A-levels. So they have to, tr the, the teachers have to try and make it more interesting for you. But in uni, it's like you are sort of doing what you are interested in. So I feel like if you are not interested, then it's kind of on you, lah, you know. You just have to, that's how I just look at it now. Like, I mean, you guys know, okay, for those who don't know, I'm not, I wasn't the most interested in medicine when I, mean, I first joined. So for me, it's a bit different from Harun, but I'm sure Harun will, Harun will say later. So like, whenever I have free time, I don't really want to like, go and talk to more patients or like try and learn more. I just want to go home and get rest, you know. That's, that's just how I am, which is not really utilizing the time well, but that's just how it is. It's just more self-directed, which is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I'm not sure what Harun thinks about it. Wait, sorry, Bharath, could you um 
like just clarify what you meant by it's paradoxical because you guys pay a lot more like what's the I mean, think because we pay so much more so you would think they would help us so much more right but actually i feel like no one really gives a shit like honestly no one like i could not attend a single day of school in year three right okay maybe not maybe not a single day lah. i could skip like maybe 75 percent of my classes and no one gives a shit yeah, that, that's what I mean by it's very, like, I pay so much so you expect. Yeah, you get what I mean. Like, you just pay more so you feel like the school has to provide more, but I think the payment is more for like, honestly, I don't even know what I'm paying for. Like, <laughs> that's just, that's think, just like. Do you think you're paying just to get that like MBBS or I don't know what it is in Singapore, but that at the end of it, just to become a doctor? I mean, Which yeah, I guess. Learn, right? Okay, wait, let's I put this like, conversation on a whole because I, I want to go back to that, but I want to hear what Harun has to say first in comparison to Barov. Okay. Um, I, I guess the, the differences between the two of us he didn't really discuss uh, we can get into that a bit more later uh, yeah so what he said about the way that we learn in the sense that the first two years is preclinical so that's really the only comparison point I have to you guys because that's when we were learning modules the same way all were learning although it's fixed modules we didn't get to choose but it's the same way like <clears throat> we'd have one lecturer take each module but we'd have um uh, just lectures and then we have tutorials uh, um, and <clears throat> I think honestly I, I don't know about the quality of Bharat's uh, professors but from our side it's honestly pretty bad like again I don't want to be bashing the quality of professors and stuff but when they teach it really doesn't feel like their priority is to teach I mean a lot of them are there you know, doing research with the university and stuff like that. And that's what, uh, maybe it's not true, but that's what it feels like their priority seems to be. Um, and in their defense, I think, um, like there's a few points that I took down that some of you were saying just now that I wanted to sort of compare to, to medical studies and why maybe it's a bit harder to achieve like a good quality lecturer from that. Um, firstly, like, um, Bhatia was talking about how he has maybe a lecture like for this particular module like once a week but when because of the density of the knowledge that we need in such a short period of time um, we have to have like for the same module maybe three four lectures a week right because we've got full days of lectures that's how it was run back then so there's not much like breathing space or time for for that lecture to set in or settle for for um for us and for the lecturers, right? Because it's just constantly just pouring knowledge on us. So <clears throat> I guess it's a bit hard to, as a lecturer, keep things interesting when there isn't space or there isn't time to to invest in making something interesting. Like the, the go-to for our lecturers is to use like um, this thing called Poll Everywhere. Um, I mean, honestly, Kahoot, you all know, is like the gold standard, right? Like at least there's some like, Com com like competition vibe to it and it's like a bit fun here and there but uh, in uni we use this thing called poll everywhere which is just so that they can receive answers from us without people having to like unmute and answer and stuff like that and that's like the only interaction we'll ever have during the lecture you know what I mean and that is a bit shocking to be honest Um, and to add on to like the paradoxical nature of like how much we're spending on school fees um because a lot of it goes to paying the hospital, I think, just for having us there. And then somehow it trickles down to the doctors, I hope, because uh, they're the ones doing the teaching. But yeah, you'd expect, especially in our first two years where we're paying a lot of money, for us to have a lot more access to uh, like better resources. You know, um, most of my study resources are from seniors. Like I'm using seniors' notes and stuff. And if I'm not using seniors notes i'm using textbooks that they recommend us to buy that are not given to us despite me paying thirty thousand dollars every year like you think it's like small things like this that they could throw in you know for the amount of money i'm paying um but yeah so an another thing is that batia brought up was the baseline knowledge thing um so for us it's integral that we all have a bit of baseline knowledge um so they can't ever teach anything to us at like you know five-year-old level like they can't approach many things from that level but at the same time i feel like they do they do do it too much the other way in the sense that they sometimes start from way too high uh, a baseline and it differs from lecturer to lecturer some of them expect you to do pre-reading beforehand and if you expect me to do pre-reading that means i'll be having a lecture from 8 a.m to 6 p.m and then 
um, after that, after 6 p.m., I'll have to do all my pre-reading for the lectures the next day, um, have dinner. I actually have to study the content as well that I've already gone through. So that cycle is just unbelievably tiring. And like Barak said, if your interest is not like out of this world, there's no way you can keep up with it. And the lecturers are not really doing anything to keep you engaged in that way either. Um, I mean, some of them are fairly like interested, I guess, but you just don't feel that, you know. And some of the content that they're teaching, to be fair, is very boring. Like it's very, very boring and it's difficult to make interesting without spending too much time on it, you know. Like I feel like those lecturers where um, you're able to do a lot more activities and spend a lot more time, it's because you can take one portion of it and spend a lot of time on that, which I don't think um, our lecturers have the luxury of doing. So that in their defense is a bit difficult. Um, and then uh, something Sahil brought up as well was the mentality of like Singaporean students and professors understanding that um, in... I don't know if it's everywhere in, in, in Singapore. I think to some extent it is, especially in medicine. The reality is that if they don't teach us well, we will still perform well, you know, because we are so independent in our learning. And um, like it's it's that whole like cream of the crop constantly, like like only the self, very self-driven um, students are going to make it to, to that point. And once you're there, it's like, everything's in your own hands. So there isn't really much push for them to improve their learning either. Um, in their defense, they do ask for feedback and stuff like that. But I think the that, that disparity just cannot be bridged. And it doesn't have to be bridged because I don't think the quality of students and the quality of doctors will go up if the quality of lectures go up. It just might improve people's mental health maybe, which I don't think they care too much about anyway. You know? Wait, Harun, so I wanted to ask... Um... Like you mentioned this vicious cycle of like like your day that is just constantly trying to keep up. Do you think that's like a problem inherent to medicine? Or do you think that's Singapore's like the way Singapore teaches medicine? And to tag on to that question, right? To tag on to that question, what about the argument that like you're talking about that vicious cycle? What about the argument that med school is supposed to be hard? Like, is that just an expectation that med you know, med school, you know what you're got you're getting into, you knew the hours were, her were horrible, you knew the content was crazy, you should have known. Like yeah. what? What do you think about that? Uh okay. I'll answer Sahil's one first. Uh, so <clears throat> wait, sorry. Could you just repeat your question again, Sahil? Like, like, do you think that's like inherent to? Oh yeah. Okay. General? Yeah. Um, I think. I mean, you can ask Barath. I think our, our work. I I I don't think it's a work ethics, uh, differential. I think it's a like our school differential means that I have to work a bit harder than than Barath does. That's just from what I've observed. You can you can add on to that later on. But I do think it's probably much worse in medicine compared to other things. Um, like I know I know you guys have your struggles at certain points as well. But I feel like uh, in medicine, it just has to be a bit more consistent because we're not really studying for an exam, you know. Like at the end of the day, we have to pass the exam every year and I have an exam after every posting. But all that is just like, I just have to pass that. Like realistically, I'm studying with the aim of being a good doctor in the future yeah. or you know because there's actually people who hopefully will be depending on me in the future you know what i mean so i don't want to put them in as like me being a poor student is only going to affect other people in the future as well as myself do you um, know like about how it's done in like other countries like how medicine is oh, taught in other i don't think so but I, I don't really know much but i know it's not easy anywhere else either yeah fair enough. um but one thing is in a lot of countries, there are some that do post-grad, obviously. There's a lot of countries that do six years. Um, some of those places will do three years of preclinical. And that makes learning the content, I think, a lot easier. Because do you, you get to... Do... six years? No, probably not, to be honest. But that's also because I've already finished my preclinical years. And like finishing faster is just better. You pay less money. Um, but... I think it does make and learning about it a lot more enjoyable if they get to space that content out into three years instead of two. Uh, but here in Singapore, there's the post-grad like Duke NUS and they learn the amount of content we learn in like a year because they have one year of preclinicals, which is absolutely absurd. But those guys are like proper hustlers. Like when I see them, like, poof, half of them are balding. <laughs> stressful life. <laughs> stressful. 
I'm never working hard enough unless I'm just because they ran out of options. Like, just look like Rahul. Yeah, isn't some of options, them are really. you know, but some of them are doing law and then doing medicine. You know, it's like yeah, because they went for law and they were like fuck this shit, and then they had they decided made the wrong choice and go to medicine. Yeah, no, no, a lot of them, a lot of them actually sign up for law plus medicine before they even enter law. Because you can yes, you, yeah, yeah, you you can you can secure your spot and in medicine later on, but then you choose your undergrad first. It's not it's not a purely I finish my degree and then I apply to Duke. A lot of people apply to Duke like when we were applying to other unis and then they applied for their undergrad and then applied for Duke immediately afterwards. But what's the point of doing a law degree and then a med- medicine degree yeah. unless you uh, wanted to be like a medical lawyer? But I feel there's like there's no real... Oh, you don't even need that, yeah. There's, there's yeah. no real discussion for that to be honest. Like this... <laughs> <laughs> it was just it's an probably, interesting fact I brought up. There's no cool. Yeah, yeah It's probably just a flex. Usually it's not law, right? Usually Sorry? it's not law. Usually they do like biomedical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there are, there are like more people that do. Yeah, they yeah. will do like at least like biomedical, that kind of thing, where it's like mm. a slow transition. It's mm. a bit of baseline knowledge. Or maybe even like business, something like that, where like at least you, you, know, you could do something with a med- medical degree and a business degree. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I'm, just, I'm just pointing out like some outliers that, that it's possible yeah, to go that route. Um, but yeah, then to answer Arman's question, which was, sorry again. What about the argument that it's just, that's, yeah, you should have expected yeah, it. Like I, should, like I signed up for this, right? You signed up uh, for this, yeah. I did, I did. To be fair, I did. Um, I think it's, it's rough and it's harsh to say because the reality of it is very different. Not, not that, like, because I knew I was going to have to be working hard. Um, but the reality of how you're learning and what that, has like the impact that has on you is very difficult to grasp until you are actually doing it so i think it's tough to or like harsh to to tell someone like you know you signed up for this because i was prepared to do the work for sure but i wasn't prepared for what that work would do to me you know what i mean um and but but do you think that it's like that's a crazy bar by the way that was bars bro <laughs> that was <laughs> ridiculous bars, bars. Fuck, man. Comes out of something drake would say by the way Say really that. No, don't don't like, yeah, don't it's compare not meant to be. it to Drake after he's dropped bars. It's not meant bro. to be. It's not meant to be. <laughs> it is fair though. No, no, the, but 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 do you think that that when you guys are studying and you're going through that vicious cycle, do you feel like it's a needless cycle? Like, do you think this is just something I have to do in order to be a good doctor, or do you think like what the hell am I doing this for? Like, there's so many ways that the faculty or that you know some other maybe like the med- medical government body or something could make this process easier and more effective you know actually uh, for me like yeah for me like surprisingly right actually no yeah like i feel like most of the things i learned i actually need to know this there's, there's never really a point when i'm like well actually i don't really want to do this okay i had it once at the start when i was really learning like the basics of medicine like basically it was bio la, and the thing is i didn't take bio so it was like a million times worse for me compared to like i don't know other bio students but other than that i feel like most of the things i learned preclinical, i felt like it was setting me up to learn about the real conditions and now when i'm in hospital i mean you can't go to hospital and say everything you're seeing i don't need to know because it's literally there in hospital like mm-hmm. you are going to see in the future so you can't say that you don't know you, you i mean let's focus you on pre- pre-clinical let's mm-hmm. focus on pre-clinical okay i mean if you are focusing on preclinical, um i think for me i try to slack as much as possible uh. so it's a bit different from harun it's not i didn't really have eight to five every day it was more like online lectures so i had the freedom of when i wanted to do my studying and then when I want to okay so your lectures which are OTOT and your tutorials are set last same as JC so I think it was a bit better than Harun's in that sense so yeah I don't think it was as bad like, I never really felt like wow this vicious cycle is hitting me and anything like that um and actually I wanted to talk about because I have some friends who went to Imperial for their like, exchange in year two and I mean NTU is attached has a partnership with Imperial, I mean, it's ending soon, but right now, it's still, it's still part, they're still partners. Uh. And honestly, one of my friends went there and he was saying it's like, the stuff they learn is fucking easy. Like, it's so much, they, the stuff that we learn in one hour, right? They, so, sorry, the stuff that we learn in 10 minutes, right? They teach you that in like, one hour or something like that. Like, this is pre clinical part. Uh. So it's like, and Imperial, and Imperial is like, literally a top 10, uh, top 10 in the world college for medicine. So it's just like, I mean, cannot be, we turn out to be better doctors than them. But at the end of the day, everyone is a doctor. So it feels like our preclinicals could actually be a lot more chill than it currently is. And at the end of the day, we would probably still turn out the same. But 
I mean, maybe that's just how it could be a Singaporean thing, right? Like we are just like get to a fast paced lifestyle. We have to learn things much faster so that if it's if it's too slow, then we will get bored, right? Like that's just how it is, right? So, but Farah, I think do you not do you not think that that's yeah, true? Do you not think that that's true? That the reason like you guys have it so rigorous and so difficult is because they are producing better doctors in Singapore or at your unis. I don't know actually. I wouldn't say so lah. I hope not. I hope not. I mean, I, I don't think the the differential is is big enough to justify the the difference that he's talking about. You know what I mean? Hmm. Uh, like, I think you have obviously superb quality doctors coming out of Singapore. Um, but there's also going to be mid doctors. It's going to be average, below average doctors. That's just how it is. And I don't think that's going to be very different from the people in the UK either. But then if you're saying that all the extra knowledge, because I'm assuming that if you guys learn things quicker means you're learning more also, right? So what do you think happens with the extra knowledge? Do you think the extra knowledge doesn't translate to actual like medical proficiency? Or do you think it's just useless knowledge that they kind of like give you, but you don't actually end up needing it to be a good doctor. I think part of it is also down to how some of them are six-year courses, so they can learn things as, learn things at a much slow slower rate. But actually, I'm not really sure for Imperial. I think it could be six years or five years. I'm not really sure, but I think that's the main thing. Like they just learn things at a slower rate because they have a longer time. And and for medicine, I feel like if I had slacked my first two years in preclinical and somehow managed to get to my year three and actually started giving a shit from my year three onwards, I feel like that is what's most important. Like when I'm actually sort of to put it in like other other course terms, like when I'm like interning and that's when I learn, I feel like at the end of the at the end of the day I'll turn out to be Wait, quite a competent. So what doctor, you're saying uh. is that the the crazy rigorous rigorousness of your first two years could be mm. avoided if you guys just didn't give a shit. And then if you start um, giving a proper shit in year three, you would have the same. As in what, what I'm saying is what I'm saying is if you study enough just to pass your exams in year one and year two, that should be enough to give you a basic foundation to go into year three. And when you go to year three, you are sort of recapping whatever you learned in year one because no one's gonna remember everything like without revising and all that, right? So you have to they'll like gloss gloss through it again. Like, so you kind of see it again and stuff like that i guess that's how everything is right like even in jc is like you're not going to remember your j1 first topic at a level you just have to go and study again i mean that's how i just look at it lah. i mean i'm not sure about you guys yeah so, then our, yeah, so our, uh no when you when we because the original question was with regards to your preclinical years do you find that the studying and the vicious cycle that you had then was like needlessly difficult do you find that it relates to what you're doing now in a beneficial way, do you think it was too much, too little? Barak, give his point. What do you mm. think? Uh, so, but they actually said something interesting. He was, um, he said like he asked where that that knowledge goes, right? Or like what what extra knowledge we're learning, like how useful is that? Um, where I think the issue lies, and why I think it's an unnecessary cycle to some extent, is because a lot of that information is literally being thrown away in my head, um, because the like what I what like like I watched a bit of that CS uh, fifty course with you the first uh, lecture right where they like it's a yeah, long yeah. course right, and even the intro they're like they they're dragging it out really long but interestingly right like I don't feel bored watching it, um, and in that in that same sense it feels like they are very interested or they put a lot of importance on building a base for you, right that you can eventually go and build on, and what messed me up the most in my preclinical years is the fact that I was never able to build a proper base of knowledge, which is why I'm scrambling a lot in these like next few years. And obviously that's not the case for every student. And that's why it might be tougher for me than other people, it's just because other people are able to maybe absorb information faster so they can build that base a lot quicker. Um, but for me, because a lot of that information that like sort of level one information and that level 10 information, it's been given the same amount of time all the way up, where rather I feel like that level one information should be given more time and then less, less, less as you go up. Because eventually I'm going to relearn all these things. Like that's just the reality of it. Like a lot of times um, a doctor will ask us something in uh, in clinics or something, for example, and I'd have no idea what he's talking about. And then he'll tell me, no, you learned this in, in your first year. And then I'll be like, oh, 
sorry, I forgot. <laughs> and then and then I'd go back and look at the lecture slide from like year one, and I'd be like, dude, it's there. Like it's in the slide. I don't ever remember them talking about this mm. before. It's nowhere, it's not even like in some small little box in the back that I can unlock if someone reminds me about it. It's just gone. Right. And because they put the same amount of importance on that entire spectrum of, of information, it ends up being like you're you're constantly chasing something. And it never feels like you're able to 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 get enough information. Where I feel like it would have been so much better if they took things a bit slower and they helped us build a better base where maybe we wouldn't be able to answer every question under the sun in year one and year two. But it gave us a very healthy base where we would never have to revisit these things. Like it's just going to like come out straight from my head very easily. And that allows me to build on that information a lot better. Because even now when, when doctors are trying to explain certain conditions or certain theories to me, I I get confused because my base is not there. Like some of the the, the essential um like physiologies and stuff it's not like clockwork in my head like it takes me a while to like sort of get that through so that i think is an issue that can be solved to be honest um and then another thing baraf was talking about the fact that he has like pre-recorded lectures like they're online lectures he can watch anytime he wants um that's another issue that i think um is the student's fault more than anything else because uh in nus we we do do online lectures but they are recorded from last year. So we can go and watch last year's one if we wanted to. And you can see the attendance rate for lectures um, just drops very steadily over the years to the point that like later on, you'd be having maybe like 40 out of 300 people in a lecture sometimes. Like that's how little students um, go for some of the lectures. And I think that's unfair to a lot of lecturers because it's sort of like, like some of them are new lecturers. Like they've just started giving that lecture, for example. Some of them have been giving it for a long time, but some of them are new. And in that case, these these lecturers aren't even given a chance in the first place. You know, um, a lot of people just give up on that online because of how rigorous the the schedule is and how tiring the schedule is. It's very hard to absorb anything from online lectures. So I also eventually did transition into using recorded lectures because it's just it's just easier. It's just better. Um, for the style of learning they've given to us, it's just better because there, there isn't much value of me being there for an online lecture. And I think that cycle also prevents lecturers from thinking, I want to improve my lecture. I want to make this more engaging. Because even if they did, honestly, the turnout rate is not going to be that much higher. You know? So, so do you think, so, so, okay, well, we've heard a lot from the med school guys. So I want to hear a little bit more from Bhatia and Sahil. I want to revisit the question that Bhatia had, which was, do you think that the amount of money that you're paying for educa for your education, for your specific course, is worth it. And if you want to, you can see how much you're paying. If you don't, that's fine as well. Um, I'm spending a lot more than uh, you guys are, obviously, as a symptom of being overseas. And the whole, for me, the trade-off was spending more money, but being in a country where I felt that my course would be better, ta better taught. And I found that so far, at least. At least, um, when I went back to Singapore over summer, I was working at this uh, media company. And while I was working there, I interacted with a few people who um, studied media or communications in Singapore. And all my bosses were generally from either the UK or Australia. So when I spoke to them, when I spoke to people I was working under, working with, I kind of took away from that whole exchange that in Singapore, the way media is taught is very similar to how we're taught in JC. I don't know if it's that if it's the same for all of you in your courses as well. Like not much changes between JC and um, uni, and that's not something I wanted to live with. Because here, it's it's pretty interesting. Uh, I quite enjoy the way it's done here. It's like it's mostly um, my course is mostly theory based as well, so it's not like I'm doing a lot of practical stuff. But just the way that people approach uh, lecturers, PAs, students, the way that everyone approaches things is, I think, a bit more um, carefree in a sense. It, it's just you're happier to be wrong about something and like you're happier to like have a like, discussion reach fruition rather than in Singapore where like people kind of like prescribe what's correct and what's wrong, especially mm -hmm. with like teachers, I feel like. And um, that kind of trade-off was what I was looking for when I came here. So obviously, like, it's a lot of money. It's uh, My course fees is £20,000 per year. 
and over and above that living costs and everything i can't even factor that in because it's something ridiculous so what i'm paying for my whole course is kind of wild and thankfully i'm in a situation where it's not um breaking the bank for my family so i'm lucky in that sense but um in my position i'd say hope like i find it worth it right now in terms of the way i'm learning and what i'm learning but it's also all for like an output and the output being that hopefully like one day i can end up like having a job in some kind of industry here so we'll see at the end of it i guess that's the best answer i can give because it's a fucking difficult question yeah it is a very tough question um, actually, i but, i think yeah. uh, i think i can answer the question now thought about it um so <laughs> I, was, I was panicking just now but I, i thought about it so okay so <laughs> my unique cost is 35 grand right 35 grand i hopefully i can make that back in like 3 years ish after like maximum 3 years after uni so i mean similar to arman i'm lucky that i have the financial means to put me in uni now like spend 35 grand in 4 years and uh, so with that in mind that i have the money to go now and i can make that back back in about 3 years i think it's definitely worth it because i mean for something like i mean if we look at my course specifically environmental science Uh yes you could learn about the environment and how the world works and shit like that online for sure but i think what you really miss out on one of one of the things is uh i think the connections like one big thing that i'm getting through my uni course is like connections like this like there's one prof that i'm working with now on a research project firstly you learn about certain research projects that people are doing that i mean you can't you can't find this out i mean you can but it's really difficult and sometimes you can't find it out because i only found out about certain research projects that my profs are doing by doing research with them and looking at what they're doing not everything they do is online like usually you you only know what they're doing you only know what they're doing which is published you don't know everything right i feel like i'm rambling a bit but what i'm trying to say is you make you you can learn about what your profs are doing what your profs contacts are doing and this opens your eyes to your future possibilities that you can work on and not only that but it gives you an in and it uh, gives you a foothold into the industry already like so for me i want to go into research now if i didn't go to uni and i want to go into research firstly that's probably impossible like research i think is one of those things you really need to go through uni just because of how the system is and secondly um through uni i'm doing research projects with a couple of profs and because of that this prof has now opened up a world of connections to professors all over the world doing coral research and research to do with fields that i want to do and this is going to give it this all like will give me a foothold in my future so in that sense I mean spending what I hopefully will make back in about 3 years 4 years for my uni is definitely worth it. And um besides just the connections aspect just in general um the content you learn and stuff like I'm one of those people that find it very difficult to learn without someone guiding me through it like not in the sense that they're spoon feeding me but just someone to give me some structure about learning what I need to learn like especially things like coding and just content that's so heavy like to learn about the world like how the world works it's a lot like it's literally the entire world right so i if you if you told me okay i'm not going to put you through uni learn how to code efficiently learn about how fucking mountains are made or something learn about how the biosphere works i i don't know if i'd be able to do it without some without someone who's experienced in the field sort of like giving me some structure to it. So to me it's definitely worth it. And yeah, yeah. And also just the experiences and stuff in uni is it's something that I'm very grateful for. Like it definitely is adding to my life, adding to who I am as a person. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I think I think one of the things that you said as well, like it's um it's easy for us to kind of ignore it because obviously all of us are in uni right now. But if let's say someone were to say, "Okay, I want to, I want to study medicine. I want to study environmental sciences," the thing is, like, it doesn't give you any baseline to start with. So if we weren't at uni, we wouldn't know where the fuck to start. Like, you don't have a kind of idea of like what you need to know. And like you said, like 
you can find these things out but you kind of said that like you already kind of know what you're looking for because you're probably just going off like modules you're taking or like topics you've been taught it's it's tough to know without that kind of like system in place around you that like you need to know these things and here's why you need to know these things because it'll help you in research it'll help you and maybe if you want to go like down policy or something like that for your course or whatever yeah and i think sorry i think another thing sorry bro uh i think another thing is that honestly in singapore at least for law courses you kind of need a degree to get a certain level of job here and having that degree would help you get a lot further i mean other than maybe in business um i think that degree holds a lot of power especially here in singapore i don't know how true that is in other places yeah sorry about you yeah so i think aman just left right so i think what sahi was just saying was was that because you can make your what you are paying you can basically make it back quite relatively fast and it gives you quite like it's quite a good investment like the sense that you get quite a lot of ins a lot of context and everything by doing uni and also partially what harun said which is that you you do need a degree to like for people to even consider you for anything serious or any jobs or anything but what i want to ask is like do you guys think that argument is a bit like it's a bit screwed up because because for me right like like just now i said we are paying a lot right then when i go for my anti football trainings and then people ask me like what's my what's my fees and i'm like oh i'm paying like this much like i'm paying like 30 plus k for for a year and stuff and it's like wow oh, there's them lots yeah what was the what's the money going for and honestly i can't answer that like, i just think like Okay, it's a bit to pay to like the hospitals, a bit for like, for the facilities in school. But honestly, I'm not really sure. Like, break break down what what is going for lah. Then they'll be like, oh, but then actually you guys will earn it back in like very fast, right? Yeah, I'm just there like, actually no, sir. Like, I'm not really earning it back that fast also. Like, like so it's it just doesn't make any sense to me. Like, if like for you guys, you can earn it back in three years. For me, if I have to pay that student loans wise, I feel like it would take plenty of years, honestly. And like that, like you guys mentioned, I'm quite lucky that. I don't have to use student loans to pay for it as well, lah. So, of course, I don't have to think about that. But if I was to think about from the point of view of many people from medicine or maybe even law, like I'm not sure about law fees, but I think it's quite a lot. I think student loans is like even after you graduate, it's quite a big thing that is always at the back of your mind. Like if you can't pay, you're definitely like, oh my god, you just be freaking out. Like first few years of your of your career, lah, which would be quite bad for your future. So I don't know. I feel like the argument's a bit. Uh, Okay, not not that it's wrong, but I think it's just not applicable for everyone, lah. That's what I feel. Yeah. But also, Baraf, like it kind of comes back to what we were gonna discuss. Uh, anyway, in terms of, do you think you're paying for the title of a doctor? And do you think you're paying for like that at the end? Basically, like the output of you having become yeah. a doctor. I think partially, uh, yeah. Yeah, if if yeah. if I could, sorry. Um, I think to add on to what Baraf was saying. Our fees being, I mean, actually, Barrow is paying about six thousand more than me every year still, um, and we don't think about how big a difference that is until you realize like some people are only paying six thousand for the whole year <laughs> of uni. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so usually we just round it up and they round it down to about thirty k. Um, so our whole five years is hundred and forty k, and we are bonded for five years and the value of our bond is 60k a year or 70k a year so the actual value of our education supposedly is about 600 plus thousand dollars or like 500 plus thousand dollars that that is that is the technically supposed to be the value of, of our that's degree like fuck done. yeah so that that's how, how much it's supposed to cost so. right? And, and once you once you consider that, if you think thirty thousand is a lot for what we're getting, hundred thousand a year for what we're getting is absolutely nothing. Bro. Like, yes, you're paying for that title to some extent, which is I guess a, a discussion for another day, which I think is like a bit messed up. But um, you're also paying for. I think they pay a lot of money to the, the hospitals just for having us there or being able to take students. Um, we are paying for facilities which we don't use, right? We're not in uni at all. We don't use our school buildings much at all. We're paying for labs which we don't use. We're paying for, like, I I guess upkeeping a lot of the lab equipment is going to be costly as well. But I think a lot of what we're going, like a lot of what we're paying is actually going into research for the school. I feel like it's funding a lot of their research. That's what I think. Uh, I have no definitive answer for you. Um, 
yeah so in in that sense i think cost wise it's not worth it um if you just look at it that way but the fact is that it is like a ticket that we have to buy if we want to do this career like that's just the 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 reality of it so no matter how valuable it is or how much we think it's worth if you want it bad enough or if you can if you have access to it it's pretty it's a pretty price in elastic commodity to be honest i mean like, on, wait, sorry on that note so like what do you what do you think of the of the obvious problem that that creates the perpetrating like systemic inequality that if you can't afford to go to med school you can never be a doctor yeah so so that's that's like so fucked that's why i said it's probably a discussion for another day because yeah that's that's, that's a whole that's we could a do a two hours on that topic, yeah. Yeah. so i mean what, yeah. what i wanted what i wanted to ask is also that i mean we've had a lot of discussion about the practicality of you know where the funds are going whether you can earn it back where you can earn the money back in in the next few years or whatever it is but i guess the main question that we have with regard to it, the education that we're currently getting is given that you're paying that much, given that you're paying 40k, 50k, 100k, isn't there so much more that the school should be doing for the money that you're paying? You know, like set aside all of, like set aside all the sunk cost of, okay, you know, some money needs to go to fund the teachers and the and the research that's being done, the, the you know, the, um, the facilities. But given that they're all, like we've already paid for all of that, do you think that you're getting your money's worth in what they're returning you? The level of education, do you think is worth that much money? Oh, man, right? we, can, if, we can throw that back to you. Like, what do you think? If you ask me, I think it's not. Lah. Because honestly speaking, personally, all I feel like I'm getting from NUS is at the start of every semester, they give me a reading list. That's basically, I'm paying 30K for, I'm paying 40K for like four years worth of reading lists. You know? Literally, that's all it is because it's so self-study based and I don't think that's the way it should be. But I think like an excuse that some maybe lawyers, some people in the industry might give is that you know, law is inherently a self-study um, type of course. You need to just put in the work and read the cases. I, I don't think that that needs to be necessarily the case. I think that yes, you do need to do a lot of independent studying and you do need to have like a reading list. You need to have all of your cases. But if you ask me to choose between um, all of the resources combined that the school has given me and the one website that one of my seniors created that is an archive repository of all the notes that the seniors have made, I would choose that repository over all the resources that the school is giving me. Because, Just curious. Oh, sorry, go on. Yeah. No, no, no. Okay, okay, ask me. Yeah, I was curious. So is it possible to get the repository, not go to law school and do the bar and just become a lawyer? Like, is that, Mate, is that's, that what that's what I'm doing now, bro. <laughs> No, but you're in, law school. you're in law school. You're like, oh, no, I mean no, no. Is, like you feasibly, actually don't have a degree. No, in Singapore, it's not possible. In the UK, I think it might be possible. But in Singapore, there's, it's a requirement to pass the bar that you have a law degree. But in the UK, I believe you can pass the bar without a law degree from a school. Because in the UK, um, the law, like being a lawyer is older than law school. They only had law schools afterwards. Mm -hmm. So there was a period of time where a lot of people just had apprenticeships and then became lawyers. Um, I'm not sure if it's still the case now, but in Singapore, definitely you need you need a degree to to be called to the bar. I've I've yeah. got a friend, uh, a couple of friends doing law, and um, that's what they said as well. Like you finish your degree and then you have to like enroll in a separate course to go take the bar. So yeah. like it's completely removed from the uni degree itself. That's pretty good. Yeah, and if I mean, that's it's... wrong, I'm gonna cut this bit out because I'll ask my friend later. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you how bad my property module is now, right? Is they've actually banned individual consultations. What? Yeah, you're not allowed to have consultations with the with the professors outside of class time. On the basis of? On the basis of it's unfair to other students who don't get the consultation and all the information no. should be evenly spread to everyone, which is it's just so stupid. That's, because well, that's then when communism. you actually do that's show up... actually just communism. The problem is that when you actually do show up for class... Because everyone has to go, everyone has to ask all their questions during the class. You have a bunch of guys who already know what's going on, who have like high level questions that are not beneficial to the rest of the class that are just trying to keep up, taking up class time. And like, fair enough to them because they deserve to ask the questions just as much as everyone else. But the value at the entire class is much lower when these guys ask questions as compared to if like just a regular average Joe asks a question, right? At that point, why not just record consultations and post them? Then all the knowledge is spread. 
That's I mean, so we haven't. So, so, so in in in, and also you're not allowed to um email a professor a question. So instead, oh. what they have is we have a discussion forum, which is like okay, fair oh. enough. You don't want to email. I understand that. You know what? You, because I think the the rationale for that was that everyone was emailing like similar questions and they didn't yeah, want to repeat themselves. That's so fair. I'm like, okay, I understand that. Have a discussion forum, fine. But a discussion forum does not replace a consultation. It like, really like. Oh. You know what I mean? Like, these kind of basic things you have to be told. Like, come on lah. <laughs> Sorry, Aman. Uh, is the reason that pe- so many people want consultations for this specific course because they're not be- it's not being taught well in the first place? I mean, it's a combination of things. I think, in general, the content is very difficult. Mm-hmm. Like, whether it was this this module or another module, people would still take- make consultations. Um, sometimes it's because the student themselves, you know, maybe they don't put in that much effort in the first part of the year. Then closer to exams, they want to cram a bit more. And they just have question. That I agree. The student, it's on the student level. If you're cramming, and you weren't paying attention, then that's a problem that that that's you know sits with the student. Um, but it's a combination. But to answer your question, it's a combination of factors. It's the course is not very well designed, and we can talk about that maybe for a little bit later because we're running out of time. But the course is not well, very well designed. The um the information is hard to get a hold of because textbooks cost like two hundred bucks. Right, and not every textbook is available. And you did like Aaron said, that doesn't come with your, with, you know, with your school fees. You don't get a textbook. You still have to fork out money for the textbook. And no one does that because there are like thirty different textbooks that you can look from. And then uh, another thing is that there's just generally a disparity in like you know you have some students who take a lot longer to 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 understand certain concepts. Um, and then that's that's not the students' fault. Like I take I take quite long to understand rather complex concepts and arguably somewhat simpler concepts as well. So so like that's not the students for as long as well, but it's a combination of things that make um consultations required. And the fact that they're not giving consultations is just a detriment to the class environment. Right. Because now when a teacher wants to have a straightforward just here's an overview of this of the subject and then we're gonna dive into like specific aspects of the topic that may be a little bit more confusing to you guys. Yeah. They can't do that because Students who have higher level questions have to run the class basically. Like they have to ask their questions. They have no other place to ask them. And that derails the conversation. It derails um the management, the, the lesson plan. And we end up in a situation where like majority of the class just doesn't feel like they benefited from the tutorial. And they have to go for the tutorial because it's attendance. La. So yeah, that's I mean that, that's that's just like like so dumb. And it and a bunch of other things as well. Like, you know, simple things like you know, the syllabus doesn't match up with the slides that they give. You know, like, it's just a bunch of stupid things that shouldn't be, like, you don't have to be told that this isn't the way that you do things. The quality um, of this mod is an exception to your program, right? Or is this, it's, like... It's not... It's Okay, the quality of this particular mod, I think, is an exception because this mod is so badly run. But I think the level that... this The, the average level um that all, across all the mods is still rather low. Yeah, I would say I would say it's still it still needs a lot of work to get up to speed. And I think it's basic things like I don't know if your schools do this. My school doesn't have any sort of town halls or to my knowledge, like at least not that not any that are advertised. Like where, you know, maybe the course convening or the dean comes down, you have you book out the auditorium, everyone sit down, have a discussion about which aspects of the course need improving, and then iterate on the course, like actually follow up and make the suggestions. All they have is this feedback form. And I don't think the feedback form is pertaining to the class, like to the module itself. I think it's just so that, um, you know, the higher ups in the school can make sure that, like, the teachers get a performance review. I, I don't think it's really specific to like improving the course structure at all. Although maybe that's like an ancillary point or tangential point, but it seems to me that primarily that's what that's like a KPI, um, that the schools track for the professors. So so like, the the mods are being run relatively poorly in my opinion. The feedback system is not great, um, and there's a lot of room for improvement, and it shouldn't be the case considering how much we're paying, you know. And again, like I would much rather just take all my seniors' notes and study for my exam that way, than take all the combined resources that the school has given me so far, because the seniors' notes are just so much better. And that's not a testament to the seniors' notes, although the seniors' notes are really good. It's a testament to how bad the school's resources are. So, yeah, I wonder, you know how I was saying that um uni, I think the biggest thing of, about uni for me is that it gives me an in and a foothold into the industry. Hmm. What a, 
does that pertain to law school or no? Um, not really. In as far as they organize networking events and the the firms themselves do come down and, and speak to you and engage more if you're from a university. But the school themselves, like, like being in law school, I don't think sets you up to have a job or to get an in into a firm. Like you do that through your internships, through your training contracts that you have to source yourself, that you have to apply for yourself. So maybe the school sets up like networking events for you to kind of understand which firm you might want to gear towards or which area of practice you might want to gear towards. But I don't think the school, like being in law school specifically, does anything much to put you in a position where you're more likely to, you know, it's not in the same way that you're talking about like research based stuff. It's 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 very different from that. Yeah. Yeah. So on that note, I think uh, I think we're gonna wrap it up for today. Yeah. Any any closing any closing statements from you guys? Uh I mean I, I wanted to ask you guys one thing actually. Like just going back to our initial discussion of the quality of Singapore's education as a whole, right? Do other countries have a have a system similar to poly? Because I think Poly is like it's fucking sick. Like it's it's so good at preparing you for the actual world. I mean, you do get a diploma at, at the end of it. And like I was just wondering, like, do you guys know? Do other countries have like similar thing where instead of JC or instead of like high school, or whatever, you go to poly and you could potentially just start working from there? Um, um the, the UK has it. The UK has a yeah. poly equivalent. So I think poly as a concept got co-opted from the UK as well for Singapore. Oh, okay. So they've got basically like when I've discussed it with my friends, it's essentially the exact same thing. I don't know. I, I know what it is, but I can't remember it right now. I can't remember what they call it here. But um, like, I think the only difference might be that they go to Bali after JC here. So it's, it's almost like a uni replacement. Like -uni. Yeah, it's just it's just a uni replacement. You get a diploma and it's essentially the same thing. Everything is exactly the same. Yeah. I mean that 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 warrants like a whole separate discussion. We could probably do like an entire episode on Polly versus JC sort of stuff. We, we yeah. need get we need to get guest stars on that one. For sure. Yeah, we definitely have to get stars on that one. Okay, yeah. <laughs> thanks, boys. We'll wrap it up here, and I'll see you on the next one in two minutes. Uh, All yeah. right, ciao, boys. Ciao, ciao, boys. Thank you for listening. <laughs>